everyone and welcome to the blessed life week 23 i hope you've been enjoying the series and i hope that you've been having a great week so far hope that god is blessing you and just pressing upon you the, the magnitude of his love and his grace and mercy for you so let's get right into it now the scripture comes from jeremiah 17 10 i the lord search all hearts and examine secret motives i give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve this is entitled it takes a heart transplant I think Luke 6.38 is a wonderful verse of scripture, but I'm also convinced it's one of the most frequently misapplied and misunderstood verses in the Bible. Its words are very familiar to most Christians. You probably quote it from memory. Give it, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. One of the most common mistakes people make about this verse is assuming that Jesus is speaking only of money. In truth, he's revealing a principle that applies to every area of our lives. This becomes crystal clear if you look at the larger context of the verse. For instance, back up a couple verses and look at verse 36 and 37. Therefore, be merciful just as your father also is merciful. Judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be condemned. You will be forgiven. It is only then that Jesus says, "Give, and it will be given unto you." Yes, this principle applies to money, but you can also give forgiveness. You can give mercy. You can give understanding. You can give patience. Jesus is simply talking about the broad principle of giving. Whatever you give is going to be given back to you in good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Luke six thirty eight. To capture the full meaning of this truth, you need to know a little bit about what the terms of good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over refer to. In reality, these were farming terms. According to instructions in the Old Testament, farmers in Israel were to leave the grain in the corners of their fields for the poor. Thus, each year at harvest time, there were two sets of harvesters in the field. The primary harvesters in the middle of the field who were being paid to bring in the crop, and the poor people in the corners who were harvesting the crop in order to feed themselves and their families. Primary harvesters out in the middle of the field would fill up a basket, carry it over to the barn wagon. They would then dump it out and go back to the field again and fill the basket once again. These, to these workers, it didn't really matter how full the baskets were. They were being paid by the hour, so they didn't care. They just needed to stay busy and keep working until all the grain was in the barn. This was not the case, however, for the poor people working in the corner of the field. The field was probably nowhere near their homes. They probably walked several miles to get there. However much food they could get in their baskets would be the amount of food available to their families. They had life and death incentive to get as much into that basket as possible. If you were in that position, you would first make sure that you had put in a good measure, not just a partial measure or a half measure. Then you would press it down to compress the grains together to create more room. After topping the basket off again, you would then shake it to eliminate any air spaces between the grains. Having done all that, you would then pour in as much grain as you possibly could, heaping it up above the rim until it began to spill over to the sides, all over the sides. It is one thing to receive a basket of free grain. It is a far better thing to receive a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over a basket of free grain. <laughs> that is why the Lord chose to use these terms. He knew that his listeners in Israel would instantly connect with the point that he was trying to make. What he communicated was that whatever you give, you're going to get a lot more of the same in return. This is a universal principle of God. You always receive back more than you give think about it this way when you give away an apple seed by planting it you don't just get back an apple seed in time you actually get back a whole apple tree and on that tree are many apples and each apple has many seeds you you get back so much more than you actually gave or give yet this is precisely where so many people go wrong regarding this passage of scripture once you understand the wonderful truth of it there is a tremendous temptation to make it your motivation for giving. Many well-meaning preachers and Bible teachers actually fall into this trap and thus encourage others to do the same. The give and it shall be given to you principle is to be our reward, not our motivation. That's why Jesus preceded this promise by saying, judge not and you shall not be judged, condemn not and you shall not be condemned, forgive and you will be forgiven, Luke 6.37. 
This context puts the, puts the promise in a very sobering light. If you give judgment, judgment will be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. If you give condemnation, condemnation will be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It works both ways. The good news is if you give forgiveness, an abundance of forgiveness will be given back to you. If you sow love, you will receive an overflowing harvest of love. This is a fundamental principle in the kingdom of God. It is a truth I've heard called the law of reciprocity. But approaching is a balanced way is a very much matter of the heart. The basic principle or problem that I have with most of the teaching I have heard on Luke 638 is that material gain is presented as the motive for giving. How do you think God feels when a preacher gets up and essentially says, come on, give to God and you'll get back more. That's a great deal. As I have pointed out, it is true that you cannot outgive God. The principle of reciprocity applies just as fully to money as it does to judgment and forgiveness. But there is nothing in scripture that says we should make a personal gain our motive for giving. How must God feel when his people only get excited about giving toward his kingdom purposes when they are whipped into a frenzy through get rich promises? Do you think God ever says, boy, if only my people could catch the vision of having a lot more stuff. God doesn't want, to, want us to catch the vision of getting. He wants us to catch the vision of giving. Yes, as we do, we will receive much more in return. And no, God is not against us having nice things. On the contrary, he loves to see his people blessed. But motives are everything. As Proverbs 16 tells us, all a man's ways seem innocent to him, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Verse 2. And James confronts the issue directly. When you ask you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Chapter 4, verse 3. When it comes to pleasing God and operating in line with his kingdom principles, heart motivation is what matters. So stay tuned for the food for thought.